Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to Psalms 148, 149, and 150. I'm already so encouraged this morning uh, by the testimony and the worship and uh, our children sharing with us. What a joy it is. And so now, my hope and my prayer is that we'll all be encouraged by the Word. Psalms 148, 149, and 150. You can open up to page 724 in the Pew Bible if you don't have your own copy of God's Word. As you're opening there, I want to remind you we are having lunch immediately after church. Uh, The purpose of this lunch, aside from fellowship and eating good food together, uh, is to raise money for our McSpadden Music Camp. Now, I want you to know, and I'm sure Nathan will share a little more about this at the end of the service as we prepare to go eat, uh, this is for us to be able to get some different instruments and some different things we need to make the camp better. Uh, That's the goal here. That's what we're trying to to accomplish and achieve. So later you may hear, we may say, if you want to sponsor a scholarship or, or something like that, and we do charge for McSpad Music Camp, you may say, well, goodness, we just had that fundraiser. But the reason for this is we're trying to enhance what we do, and it allows us to keep things very low cost uh, for those who participate. So at the end of the day, here's what we hope you'll do. Come downstairs and eat. And the great thing is you get to pay what you want to pay for lunch this morning. So whatever you feel like giving, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, whatever you would ordinarily spend for lunch maybe, uh, give that today and the Lord may encourage you and lead you to do more and that's fine, but we'll be down there eating. I want to say one other word to our guests about lunch. I know we say it's a fundraiser lunch, but we want you to know that we would love for you to eat with us this morning under no obligation whatsoever to spend anything. We'd love uh, to give you, and if you want to, that's fine. We won't Trust me, Becky will probably be taking up money. She won't turn any away. But the, the reality is we would, uh, we, would love, we would love for you to just be our guest this morning, not worry about that at all. If you have your Bibles open there, I want you to go and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. We're, we're going to just read Psalm 150, and then we'll refer back to the other two as well. Hear the word of the Lord, as the psalmist writes, it's as if God himself is speaking to you. Beginning in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, today I ask You, would You open our hearts and minds to receive your word and to be changed by it. God, will we be a people of worship? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I was new to being a Baptist and new to being in a youth group when I went on my first youth retreat to the Chattanooga Choo Choo. And uh, it was pretty cool. It was a pretty exciting thing. We got on a bus, we rode down there. And it was because I was, this was the 90s, and I'm an evangelical Christian. It was a true love waits retreat. Now, at that point in my life, I didn't understand at all the things I was going to go through that weekend. But I went through a lot that weekend. It was an experience, and I was baptized there into the world, not literally, but baptized into the world of 90s youth group culture. Something I wasn't used to, I was new to it, and we went to the first worship service while we were there. And this was a worship service unlike any I'd ever been to in my life. It involved a band. Everybody's getting nervous now, starting to sweat a little bit. It involved a band. And there I was, a middle school boy, and I look around me and people are doing things that I've never seen done in worship before. Now, Grew up in a, in a small country church that was a very lively church. Don't get me wrong. We, they knew how to holler at Union Church. Uh, but this wasn't hollering. This was different. There's people raising their hands and closing their eyes. and just I, I'd never experienced it before. 
And then after about the 17,000th verse of Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, I decided that I hated this. Now, I'm not opposed to contemporary Christian music. I'm not opposed to people who worship with a band. I praise God for all different kinds of worship offered to Jesus. There's a lot of different kinds all over the world that's happening. But over time, I just realized I, this is just not for me. I, I, I just don't like any, anything that's happening here. And, and over time, I, that began to kind of sort of color for me what worship was. And, and, and now as a pastor, I, I meet people and, and, and like the deepest, darkest confession I get from people is usually this. Are you all ready for it? I've had people tell me, I don't think I'm excited about heaven. And I think, okay, why? Now everybody, some of y'all in the room are thinking, yeah, that's me. And he said, what's he going to say? Because I need some help. And the reason so often when I encounter people who say that, I just don't think I'm excited about heaven because what they think is that heaven is going to be one really long weekend True Love Waits retreat at the Chattanooga Choo Choo. <laughs> that they think that we're going to just sit there and then they're going to say, and the second, and the third, and at some point or another, and the millionth verse, you know, and we're just still singing all the whole time. That's all that we'll do. Now, for some folks, that sounds wonderful. So some people just would love to do nothing but sing. But I, I think what this does, because we say that in heaven we'll worship God perfectly and that God will be worshipped perfectly forever, that what we think that means is that we'll be trapped in a really long, endless worship service that is also sort of boring. And, and I, I want you to know something that that betrays in our hearts and our minds and our lives a misconception, a misunderstanding we have about what worship is. Worship is not just singing, and singing is a very important part of worship. I think we do it in a beautiful way, in a very much not boring way here every Sunday. I love it. I love what we do. It's engaging. We've got good content. It's important. But worship is about more than just singing. Worship is about more than just what we do in an hour here on Sunday mornings. Worship is about encountering the living God and offering to Him praise. You see, the Psalms, the songbook of Israel, the worship guide of Israel, they don't just end, they crescendo. They don't go out with a whimper, they go out with a bang. They can crescendo with a series of psalms. I wanted to show you three of them this morning. A series of psalms that demonstrate overwhelming, universal, passionate worship of God. And we do. We, we sell worship so short so often. We limit it, limit it to the hour a week we spend here. Or we limit it by our musical or stylistic preferences. Or we limit it to music alone or we limit it to our comfort zone. However, worship is bigger than any, than any of these things. This morning, as, as quickly as possible, I, I want to show you three points that I think can help you grow in your understanding, your knowledge of worship, and in your own personal practice of worship. Here, here's the first point this morning. Here, here's the first point. My, my hope and my prayer is that you will praise God for the work of His Son. Praise God for the work of His Son. In other words, our worship must be Christ-centered. We must be focused on Christ when we worship Nathan read all of Psalm 148 to us. It's a beautiful psalm. There's so much there, but I, I really want to focus in on the 14th verse of Psalm 148. He has, the psalmist tells us, raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. It seems like a strange sort of thing. He's raised up a horn. And now this isn't talking about like a like a trumpet or a bugle type horn. This is talking about a symbol of power, a horn like you might see on an animal. In other words, you see an animal with a horn, you recognize that horn is the business end of that animal. The time I was a summer missionary in Wyoming, I got to go to a buffalo farm. 
and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life for a lot of levels. I can tell you more about the story later if you want to know, but it was a fascinating experience. And you're next to this gigantic animal, and it's got these pretty sharp horns, and you start, and you're from Alabama, never been around a buffalo before, and a rancher from Wyoming says, son, you don't want to go there. You don't want to stand there. With this test we're about to run on this buffalo, I'm telling you, he can, he's one shake of his head away from uh, sending you to the hospital and maybe to the grave. In other words, you don't want to be on the business end of a buffalo. right? You want to stay clear of his horns. And so throughout the Psalms and really throughout the Old Testament, there's this picture of God demonstrating his strength and his power by raising up a horn. There's imagery throughout the Old Testament that will talk about the power and strength of a, of a pagan nation and talk about the horn of that nation. And, and this image takes on with it a connotation that God will raise up a person as his horn, as the demonstrator of his power and authority. It carries with it messianic overtones. That God's people will have a horn whom he raises up who will be a son of David, a a descendant of the king, a powerful leader, a strong ruler. As Christians, we look back on this and we recognize that this horn, this Messiah, this leader, this ruler is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you look at the Psalms, I I would argue that Psalms 1 and (coughs) 2 open up with a description of the blessed man, and then Jesus picks up that similar imagery of what it means to be blessed when he uh, begins preaching and preaches the Sermon on the Mount. And then Psalm 2 refers very clearly to the Son who must be kissed, and why do the nations rage, and the ruler and leader of God's people. And so the Psalms open, Israel's songbook, the praise book of Israel, opens with songs about the Son, and they close with resounding praise unto God. Why? Because God has raised up this horn for his people what a beautiful picture we have then that since the beginning so long as God has had a people he's asked them and encouraged them and commanded them to worship him for the work that he is doing through his son all of God's people's worship has always been and will always be Christ centered We must be the people who praise God for the work of His Son. The New Testament picks up this idea and lets us know then that what God has done must result in what I would call a worshipful dedication of the whole of our lives. A worshipful dedication of our entire lives. Paul tells us in a famous verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, what? Which is your spiritual worship. We'll talk about the importance of corporate worship here in just a moment, but I, I want to remind you of something. That Sunday morning, the Lord's day, when you come together with the Lord's people, when you come here to worship, that's not the beginning and end of your worship for the week. This is the overflow of your worship for the week. You bring something to worship. Now, obviously, there are lots of Sundays when we come in here and we need something from worship. I understand that. I get that. We, we, we've all been there. We've all come in here weary and tired, and this isn't a blessing that we can come in and be refreshed by spending time worshiping God here. But that's more the exception than the rule. The rule is that we come with something to worship, that we bring something to God, that we're overflowing with the worship that was already happening this week. All of our lives is worship. And that's why we can worship in heaven forever, because heaven won't just be church forever. Heaven will be us living the life that Christ has promised to us forever. And so I I believe that the activities in heaven from the picture I get in the Bible are, are varied, just like the activities here are varied. But we worship through living out what God has asked us to do. What Jesus has done should motivate us to worship Him. Second of all, second point this morning is this. We must praise God joyfully. Praise God joyfully. Psalm 149, the first half of it, first five verses Say, sing to the Lord a new song and His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in His maker. 
Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Another picture there in verse 5 of all of our lives consisting of the worship of God. But here's the reality. Do you see this exultant picture that's here? I was just talking to Nathan about this this morning. I, I, for the best I can tell, Christianity is the only religion in the world, at least at this point, that primarily sings joyful songs. Judaism and Christianity are the only religions that sing joyful songs, songs of praise, songs that come before God with joyful praises. You see this picture we see here, how, how our joy is compounded by the very nature of worship, corporate worship. Worshiping together, we see in verses 1 and 2, compounds our joy. We see in verse 3 that earnest expression of worship compounds our joy in worship. Now listen, we're, we're generally speaking a more reserved church. And sometimes I, I feel like folks who are more reserved people and more reserved worshipers can read passages like this and start to feel a little guilty. But I, I don't think the Bible is ever dealing in the superficial. Over and over and over again, the Bible is doing its best to get out of the realm of the superficial. So I'm not really so worried about whether or not we're doing superficial things every week. Just things to demonstrate how joyful and excited we are. We don't have to do that. Now, not everyone who does that is doing that superficially, but some people are just wired different ways, and some churches are just wired different ways. And that's okay. We don't really want Nathan to grow out a ponytail and uh, get a smoke machine up here. You know, we don't, that's not really what we're looking for here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean, though, that we can't be joyful. And that doesn't mean that if you choose one Sunday that you want to express yourself a little more than you normally do, that doesn't mean it's wrong to do. It's okay to do that. God is not saying we can't do that. God's joy compounds our joy. The Lord, verse 4 says, takes pleasure in His people and He adorns the humble with salvation. God is a joyful God. And so therefore, we ought to reflect that joy in our own lives. And what's more, Worshiping through the week, continual worship, worshiping when we're on our bed, worshiping as we go, worshiping in all that we do compounds our joy in worship. Brothers and sisters, my hope and my prayer is that worship will be something that's not boring to you, that's not frustrating to you, but something that's joyful to you as you bring your praise to God and that God lifts you up through worship. My hope and my prayer is that you will do so joyfully. <clears throat> but finally, not only ought we to praise God for the work of His Son and praise God joyfully, but finally, we ought to praise God exhaustively. We ought to pray God, praise God exhaustively. Let me put it like this. There is no time, there is no place, there is no time, there is no place, there is no situation which can put a boundary on the praise that God is owed. Let everything, the Bible says, that has breath, praise the Lord. Play, praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. That's a picture of God's holiness and otherness from us. We ought to praise God where He is and for who He is. And verse 2 says, we praise Him for His mighty deeds and that we praise Him according to His excellent greatness. So we praise God for all of His works. And we praise God for the excellencies of His nature. When we consider who God is and what He's done, the fact that God is infinite, that there are no boundaries on what God is able to accomplish, that there are no boundaries on the time in which God has existed, that in every perfection you consider that God has, there's an infinity to it, that God stretches out forever in any direction in terms of how good and how great He is, in terms of how long He's existed. God is fathomless. God is 
endless. And so therefore, that ought to inform the sort of worship we have that we can worship God forever and not grow tired and not run out of new things to say about our good and glorious God. He's excellent and He's worthy of praise. And so we ought to praise God for the excellencies of His nature. And so God's lack of boundaries in His goodness and His greatness ought to to shatter the boundaries we have on when and how we worship. We owe it to Him. God is totally exhaustive. There's nothing that brings an end to God. Therefore, nothing should bring an end to our worship. Verses 3 through 5 gives a litany of different sorts of instruments. I think when you've got a list this long, it's obviously not an exhaustive list of all the instruments one could use to praise God with, but I think it gives us the idea, and if you look back at all these psalms we're looking at here, and really all of the Psalter, you, you begin to think in terms of God is okay with us worshiping Him with multiple means. There's just lots of ways to do it. And that's a good thing because God is so broad in who He is. There are multiple, multiple, multiple things that bring Him glory. But I love this last verse, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 1, praise the Lord. Verse 6, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. These are the bookends of this psalm. These are the bookends of our lives. We begin and we end with praise unto God. There's nothing under all of creation. Everything that has breath owes praise to God for who He is and what He has done. Brothers and sisters, my hope and my prayer for each and every one of us here today is that we will be able to walk with God because of what the Son does, has done, in joy and without boundaries for praise to God forever and ever and ever and ever. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put your trust and your faith in Jesus for the first time, I'd love to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a Christian. I I, I really believe with all my heart, if you'll turn from your sin and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus Christ, I believe He will save you. And second of all, you may say, Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I've just not been worshiping the way I should. I'd, I'd love to talk to you this morning, pray with you, or if you just want to use this altar, it's open and available to you. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, for what he's done for us. And God, we do thank you for your infinite worth and your infinite excellencies. And God, it is my prayer, it is my prayer, God, that you would move in our hearts and lives today to respond to who you are and what you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.